All right, so we are going to discuss a prophecy update tonight, and also we're going to jump into a lot about what the red heifer is, who the red heifer is, what the Jews are looking for, why they need one, etc. And so we are going to be in, if you're not there already, we're going to be in Numbers chapter 19. I'm going to give you a heads up. We're going to have a lot of slides tonight. Uh, exciting time. This is um, this is the end of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. You guys, if you know me, I love studying uh, Yeshua or Jesus in the Old Covenant times, uh, in the Old Covenant scriptures, especially in Torah. And uh, as we study something like the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur, it actually ended tonight at sundown. The Jews look at uh, wanting a temple needing to get rid of their sins, they want to atone for their sins, and of course, we know that we don't look to a high priest that's an earthly high priest, we look to who? To Yeshua, our great high priest. So let's remember that during this time, be thankful to God, and also be equipped to minister to the Jews, Jews and Gentiles alike. So tonight we're going to have a prophecy update, and we'll discuss about the red heifer. So I want to be able to share this with you that um, some of you guys know recently the Temple Institute had announced that they received a bunch of red heifers. So we'll talk about that tonight. So on also Sunday, this past Sunday was Rosh Hashanah. So these are the high holy days on the Jewish calendar, the most holy time of the year. Uh, the only forced fast, commanded fast every year, of course, was Yom Kippur, which just ended tonight. So for many Jews, though, Today was a day of atonement. Just ended at sundown. So many Jews are pondering right now their need for sins to be atoned for. They're pondering things like purification. How do I purify myself? And literally, those that say they're living according to Torah, according to the law, they're lying. There's no way. I know this, you know this, and especially when you're studying the day of atonement, Leviticus 16, which we went through on Sunday, is the law of laws they are forced to send a high priest into the Holy of Holies. They don't have either the Holy of Holies or the high priest. So it's impossible for anybody to keep Torah, to keep the law. So many Jews desire a temple. They desire a priesthood. They desire the ability to obey Torah. They want priests to make offerings for their sins. The priest and the priesthood symbolized intercession. They want an intercessor, but praise God, we have the New Covenant, New Testament scriptures that say things like we are, there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So you and I have not just a priest, not just a high priest, but a great high priest, and that's Yeshua Messiah. And check this out. A lot of Jews want the water for purification. We'll get into that. And what it is. By the way, what was the very first miracle that Jesus did? Water to wine. John chapter 2. What's the significance for this? Not, and I've heard things like, Jesus loves weddings. He's in, have him as the center of your wedding. Those things are nice. Yes, we know principles. They're great. But the significance in Judaism is that he used the red heifer water the water for purification. In other words, to the Jews, you don't touch that. You don't mess with that. That was a signal in Judaism. We'll get into that tonight, hopefully. So, this is an article from the Jerusalem Post, Thursday, September 15, 2022, 5 p.m. Five perfect unblemished red heifers arrived at Israel's Ben Gurion Airport from Texas, of all places. Texas, the United States. And it was for the Temple Institute. Now, previously, you, you heard me mention an update uh, two years ago. I did a, a YouTube video on that. You could Google for that or search for that and see it, uh, where we updated on the fact that the Temple Institute had two potential red heifers, or what we say, red heifer candidates. One of them fell out shortly after that, and I believe the second one already did. So... This is unprecedented. Right now they have five perfect, unblemished red heifer candidates. Five. 
Hold your questions for later. <laughs> so they've got these, and they're candidates. They have to wait. They have to be inspected continually to make sure they maintain kosherness, <laughs> make sure they're kosher. All right, but this is big news right now for Jews as well as Christians because all the way from Texas to Israel, like Jerusalem Post uh, and many other outlets reported on, these red heifers arrived in Israel. All right, so we'll get into this, but I think we need to cover uh, a lot of the basics tonight, and I don't want to assume that everybody knows this. So we're going to look at first, what is a red heifer? So again, if you have your Bibles, please turn to Numbers chapter 19 if you're not there already. And I'm going to try to quickly go through a bunch of these slides. So what is the red heifer? So this comes from Numbers chapter 19 in the Bible. I'm also going to display it here on the screen. Numbers 19, verse 1 says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they bring you a red heifer without blemish, in which there is no defect, and on which a yoke has never come. All right, so just to break this down, it says heifer. So basically, it's a cow. Right? It's a female. It's not a bull. It's not the boy. So it's a heifer. And it also says red. Okay, so all hairs must be red. Can't have two hairs that are not red. Here's a Jewish commentary. I quoted this. This is called the Rashi commentary. Quote, this means that it should be perfect in redness, that if there were in it as few as two black hairs, it is disqualified that's what makes it really tough so it's a red heifer and also it's to be without blemish so this means it can't have any kind of imperfections or injuries throughout its entire life this is the reason why they want to protect it in un undisclosed locations if there's a sniper out there saying let me make sure there's four now or someone goes and they get a knife and they cut it a little bit, it's disqualified. They have to make sure that is without blemish, can have any kind of injury at all. Also, it says no defect. So it can't have any birth defects. has to have all four legs. Everything's got to be intact. And also notice it says, this is Numbers 19, verse 2, a yoke has never come. So it could have never have had a yoke placed on it. You couldn't sit on it. It couldn't be used for work. You couldn't even lean on it. That's crazy to think of. Like you're kicking back, talk to your homeboy, you put your elbow on it. <laughs> it's disqualified. You cannot have any work. It can't even do the work of childbirth. Couldn't go through the labor of childbirth. So it has to remain a virgin. It cannot be bred with a bull. That's obvious. Okay. So this is all wrapped up in what is this red heifer, what are the stipulations? So question, why do the Jews need a red heifer? Again, I'm going to just quickly go through these here. Why do they need this? Well, they have to have the ashes of a red heifer because they want to reinstate, they want to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. So think about it. If you're looking at this, you're a contractor, you just go, all right, I want to build a building. Let me get the plumbing. Let me make sure I have all the permits. And you think it's just a physical structure. But, praise God for the scriptures. In Numbers 19 is hidden this little clause that the priesthood has to be pure, has to be cleansed. So, God's in control of all these things. They want to rebuild the temple, but they can have a temple which they don't have. They can build it on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, which they do not have access to. They can even have a priesthood, which supposedly they have a priesthood lined up, being trained, and even the clothing, the garments, being created and built. They can have everything in place, which they don't have everything perfectly, but even if they did, they still could not use a priesthood. They couldn't use a temple. They can't use any of the furnishings. Why? Because they need to be purified. <laughs> God's got this little clause there, right? So they need the red heifer water, the water for purification. In order to make this water for purification or the red heifer water, you have to have a red heifer. 
So we're going to get into that. So why the Jews need a red heifer? They have to have the ashes of this red heifer to be able to cleanse everything. So this is why many Jews are excited right now. And this is why I want us to look at and do this little prophecy update. Uh, pray for me. I was even contemplating, oh, there's, there's some others that I think could do better. But this is my area of study. One of the things I've, perf- I've loved is studying the tabernacle, uh, seeing Christ in the scriptures, and especially things like the red heifer, the temple, the tabernacle. Oh, I love this. I, love, like, I salivate when I think of these kind of things. But the Jews are really excited. Not all, but many Jews are. The ones that want to rebuild a temple, the ones that want to really get rid of their sin, because there's no way that they can get rid of their sin. And uh, the Law of Laws, or Yom Kippur, every year, including the one that just passed today, is a reminder every single year that the Jews have sin, they cannot get rid of sin, they need a temple, they need a priesthood, they need to get rid of their sin. And of course, we who believe Yeshua is Messiah, we know who took away our sin, who took it upon himself. Okay? But our beloved friends that are Jews, as well as Gentiles, they do not know this. So let's get equipped through the word. But the Temple Institute, as you know, as we just looked at, they receive five perfect unblemished red heifer candidates. They're not perfect yet to be used. They're candidates. They have to wait till they get older, okay? which is under God's control. And there's a guy named Maimonides, this Jewish rabbi, Maimonides. It's a picture of him, supposedly, uh, or rendering. He stated that the red heifer has to be offered up in its third or fourth year. There's speculation because some would say and claim that in its second year they could use don't know, it's going to be up to the Temple Institute and the Jews. Okay, that's out of our control. We want to monitor these things because there are a bunch of prophecies that happen around and especially after the time that the Jews uh, reinstate a temple and its sacrifices and offerings. But one of the main ones, the old Jewish sage that is quoted and looked upon is Maimonides. And he believes a, a red heifer will be offered up in its third or fourth year. And the ones that they have right now are about a year old. Do the math. If they can wait till it's two years old and these five red heifer candidates are one year old, how long do the Jews have to wait? A year. If they have to wait until the red heifer is no longer a candidate but qualifies and is kosher, they only have to wait till the third year and they're one year right now, how long do the Jews have to wait? two years. This is why it's exciting for us. How many days is that? That could be within the realm of 365 days or so, 700 days. So we're talking exciting times we live in, right? And this is unprecedented. There's nothing prior to look at to compare against. The the best that they had, the closest they had was actually two years ago when they had two perfect unblemished red heifer candidates. Now they have five. (laughs) Pretty neat to see. So question is how will the jews get the ashes of this red heifer here's what it says in numbers 19 again look at verse 3 verse 3 says you shall give it to eliezer the priest that he may take it outside the camp and it shall be slaughtered before him so a jewish priest is going to take the red heifer quote outside the camp so he's got to take it outside the temple area and check this out. This I grabbed this picture off the Temple Institute's website. Temple Institute. They're preparing to offer up a red heifer. Guess where? The Mount of Olives. When this red heifer is available, they already want to offer it up. They believe this is the place where it did get offered up. And they already got pretty much the site specced out. They had an artist render this, either them or someone else. Uh, and you can see way in the background there, that's supposedly the temple. And that's the city of Jerusalem. That's the Mount of Olives. <laughs> a highly prophetic place. Even Jesus referred to it quite a bit. So they're getting ready to do this when they do have this. Let's continue on into Numbers chapter 19. Verse 5. We can jump to 5. It says, Then the heifer shall be burned in his sight. Its hide, its flesh, its blood, and its offal shall be burned. And the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet and cast them into the midst of the fire, burning the heifer. And then jump down to verse 9. 
You can read the whole chapter later on for better context and clarity. Numbers 19, verse 9, that a man who is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and store them outside the camp in a clean place. And they shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel for the water of purification. It is for purifying from sin. Here's God's little clause that he puts in, in Torah, that they are forced, commanded, they're compelled where they have to have water of purification. Why? It is for the purifying from sin. So what they're going to do is they get this red heifer, they burn it, they're going to burn it on the Mount of Olives, and they're going to get the ashes of this red heifer, they're going to mix it in water, they don't need much within the water, supposedly to create this water of purification. So why do the Jews need the ashes of a red heifer? Again, verse 9 in Numbers 19, to make the water of purification. So this water of purification, it has to be used so they can consecrate over the priests, the temple furnishings, everything. And without the purification, the priests, the temple, everything in Judaism that they want to purify or have cleansed, it's useless. So they can't use any of these things or any of the people to sacrifice for sins or to make offerings. And they're reminded every breath in, every breath out, I'm in sin. I cannot get rid of my sin. God's got them, man. I I love this. It all points to Yeshua. (laughs) He is our Messiah. He's our great high priest. Okay, and by the way, the red heifer was also a similar picture of Jesus, Messiah. But what does the red heifer signify for the Jews? The building of the third temple. So when the Jews hear about end times prophecy, and yes, they talk about end times prophecy, just like us biblical Christians, they consider it as a talk or discussion about building the third temple. They talk about, we're going to have a temple on the Temple Mount, and it's getting closer. (laughs) World peace. Hear hear the the terminology. They talk about world peace. Messiah is coming. The era of Messiah is upon us. He's going to usher in world peace and world purity. Here's the crazy thing. Right now, we're at the, the tail end of these last two years or so of this supposed pandemic, right, with COVID and all. Everybody's like scared. They want to get cleansed. It's, it's working right into the Jewish mindset and their current theology in Judaism, Orthodox Judaism, those that want to rebuild a temple because they know that the world wants purification. And their answer to it is get a red heifer. We can get this water of purification. You could be purified. It's like so crazy how this is now being used. Who would have thought but God, right? So for the Jews, though, it's signifying the building of this third temple. Okay, And the question is, how many perfect red heifers has Israel had? You may have heard me mention about this before. But this guy, again, Maimonides, he wrote that there's only been nine perfect red heifers. So all the way from Moses at the time of the reading here, we're looking at Numbers 19, and the first high priest, the brother of Moses, whose name was what? Aaron. Good. So all the way from Aaron to the time of Jesus, 2,000 years ago roughly for you and I today, there's only been nine perfect red heifers. Isn't that crazy? From, from eternity past, as far as the world would say, or let's say from, from the beginning of creation or time of Moses till now, there's only been nine perfect red heifers. Okay? That's all they had until the second temple was destroyed in 70 AD. And he writes uh, which, which uh, priests were the ones to offer it up and so forth. There's only been nine. So who do many Jews believe will present this tenth red heifer? Please understand this. We're, what we're looking at here, this is not in the Bible. This is what many Jews now who follow Orthodox Judaism and want to rebuild a temple and follow the writings of Maimonides, who do they believe will present this 10th red heifer? They believe it's going to be presented by Messiah. 
Whoa. I mean, if you think about this, how crazy that is, right? Wait a second. The Jews are waiting for a Messiah. Messiah did come, right? And they missed him already. What's his name? Jesus, Jesus Yeshua. This is not going to be Yeshua, Messiah of Nazareth. They're going to receive a Messiah. You know, when we study biblical end times theology, we know the Messiah is going to come for them, but it's going to be a false Messiah. So it's crazy how this is being, it, it just dovetails beautifully into what God's already prophesied about the end times. So Maimonides believe the 10th is also the last red heifer. So they talk about this, this is end times prophecy. They sound like Christians the way they talk about this. This is end times prophecy. And Maimonides believe the 10th is going to be the last red heifer that will usher in the era of Messiah. And it's going to be brought by Messiah himself. Here's what Maimonides wrote. And the 10th will be brought by the king Mashiach. May he speedily be revealed. Amen. So may it be God's will. <laughs> Isn't that crazy to think? So there's many that follow his writings, for Orthodox Jews, and those that surround the Temple Institute, which is a leading, by far, the, really the only and leading organization that's pushing for the rebuilding of a temple. They're following him and his writings. So they believe it's going to usher in the era of Messiah. You and I know from what God prophesies, they will receive a Messiah, but sadly, the Jews at large will receive a false Messiah. So what about our Messiah, Yeshua, or Jesus? What did our Messiah, Yeshua, say about these times that you and I live in? Okay, so if you're in the Bible, go to Matthew 24. It's here on the screen being displayed, but I also want you to know where it is in the Word. So the first book of the New Covenant or New Testament, Matthew chapter 24, it says, this is Matthew quoting Jesus himself. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. And then Matthew, if you have a red letter Bible, you'll see that these words here on the screen, it's in white. In your red letter Bible, you'll see a parenthetical statement written by Matthew. He, he intersperses this quote here or this, these words it's called an aside, a parenthetical statement. Whoever reads, let him understand. So he's telling you, as you read this or listen to this, understand what Jesus is talking about. So you must, you must. So biblical end times prophecy, we must study Matthew 24. And when Jesus says to check out Daniel, you got to go back in the book and take a look. So Matthew Levi is quoting Yeshua. And Matthew tells us we must understand Daniel's prophecy of what's called the abomination of desolation. Sounds like a big term, but Jesus quotes it. That's Matthew 24. So here's what it says in Daniel 9, verse 27. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. So that's a period of seven years. But in the middle of the week, or three and a half years, in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. That's Daniel 9, verse 27. All right, so there's going to be a man that will make a seven-year covenant with Israel. And three and a half years into this covenant, he'll, quote, bring an end to sacrifice and offering, end quote. Where is the sacrifice and offering? It's only done in the temple. So this is a future prophecy that has not yet been fulfilled. When you put these pieces of the puzzle together, these end times prophecies surrounding the temple, you realize there must be a coming physical temple. It can only be built in Israel, only on the piece of property that we call the Temple Mount. It has not been built. This has not been done. So will it happen? Yes. Why? God says it, right? So when you study end times prophecy like this, just like fulfilled prophecy already, it's so exciting, guys. It helps us to also have awesome faith in all the totality of God's word because we know this is going to happen in the future. And we also know that the things that God prophesies and says to you and I today in his word, should we believe it? Should we stand on his word of truth? Yes, we should. We must. His word stands forever. It's Isaiah 40, verse 8. So this seven-year covenant is going to be broken. 
because it says there's going to be an end to sacrifice and offering, we know that there has to be a restarting of sacrifice and offering. God's got this stuff all kind of controlled on the timeline. I love this. Now going into the New Testament in Paul's writings, here's what it says now in 2 Thessalonians. You can turn there to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Again, for these chapters, you can read the whole chapter for greater context and clarity. I'm just going right to the point and quickly going through slides here to bring you up to speed. So 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3 and 4, it says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's Second Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4. So the, quote, man of sin, or also called the son of perdition, he's going to be revealed. This is the one that many people today refer to, quote, anti-Christ. Okay, he's going to enter the temple of God. He sits as God. He's going to show himself that he is God. And quoting Jesus from Matthew 24, verse 15, he's going to be standing in the holy place. To the Jews, they understand, oh, that means there's going to be a physical temple and there's going to be this man who's a son of perdition, a man of sin. He'll be revealed. He's going to go in the temple. There is no temple, though, so there must be a future temple. That's how we know, oh, the Jews are going to rebuild a temple. It's got to be in Israel, got to be in Jerusalem, got to be on the Temple Mount. And he's going to sit as God. He's he's not God, obviously, but he's going to sit as he is, like he is God. He's going to show himself that he's God, but he's not. He's just a liar. He's going to be standing in the holy place. So the Jews know that these are Jewish terms. This thus and therefore means there must be a coming future physical temple it's not a spiritual temple a physical temple okay that's second thessalonians 2 verses 3 and 4 okay and i do want to mention at this point because i i spoke with others and when you look at these and you actually study what the word of god says and you look at these things you study in depth and detail with analytical serving the totality of what's revealed in god's word you realize looking even in the blessing of history that we have This has never happened. Because this has never happened, we know it must be future prophecy. Make sense? Amen? Must be future. And I've spoken with some that don't want to believe, as we believe, that there's going to be a refocus back on Israel after the rapture of the church, is what we believe. And some that don't want to believe there's going to be a physical temple, they'll say, oh, this has already happened. And even Revelation is not future, it's already been fulfilled, or it's spiritual fulfillment all around us right now. No. The majority of the book of Revelation is future prophecy, as we say that term eschatology, the study of biblical end time events. Okay, the closest though who came to fulfilling the abomination of desolation The only one who came close was Antiochus Epiphanes, but he never was one who entered, quote, the temple of God, quote, standing in the holy place, quote, sits as God, showing, quote, showing himself that he is God. He never did that. And so there'll be some that say, oh, Antiochus Epiphanes already fulfilled that. You guys are crazy thinking there's going to be a future temple. Uh, The Jews are replaced by the Gentiles. You guys ever hear of replacement theology synonymous with a lot of people in Reformed theology or Calvinist folks? Not all, but many. And they replace Israel. Even when they study Romans, Romans 9 through 11 is all about a focus on the nation of Israel, not individual personal salvation. They'll even take that. Why? Because their theology would be to get rid of the Jews or replace Israel with the Gentile church. You can't do that with the Bible, okay? And remember, your doctrine informs your actions. So if we just take faith at face value for what God says in his word, we realize this is future. This has not yet happened. Okay, so we must, we must, we must know that. So this has never happened. So I just want to point this out for eschatology as you're studying this. Don't let people confuse you and say, no, this is already in the past. 
This is future, has not happened yet. So here's what it says in Daniel's book now about this thing called the abomination of desolation, quoting Daniel 11, verse 31, Daniel 12, verse 11. It says, And forces shall be mustered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. Then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there, quote, the abomination of desolation. Jesus referred to that. Remember from Matthew 24, verse 15. Also, Daniel 12, 11 says, And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Okay, so I want to refer to that because these are some of the scriptures that Jesus refers to in Matthew 24, verse 15, when basically Matthew Levi quoting Jesus saying, if whoever reads, let him understand. So go back and read and understand these prophecies about the abomination of desolation from Daniel chapter 9, chapter 11, and chapter 12. And what does it point you to? The fact there's going to be a future temple. It was future to Daniel, it was future to Matthew Levi, but it's future still to you and I today because this has not happened. Because it hasn't happened, we can count on God, amen? That his word is true, his word stands forever, this will be future. You can count on that, please do. Okay, so when we fit this within our lives, we realize uh, God is trying to you know, get us to be serious about him. At the time of the abomination of desolation, there's going to be an end to daily sacrifices and an end to the offerings in the temple. Again, Daniel 9 verse 27 says, But in the middle of the week, or three and a half years in the seven-year covenant with Israel, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Another one, Daniel 11 verse 31 says, Then they shall take away the daily sacrifices. And then Daniel 12 verse 11 says, And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away. What does this mean? The Jews understood this in Judaism. There's going to be a reinstatement of biblical sacrifice according to Torah. You and I don't have to do that, obviously. But the Jews are trying to get rid of their sins right now, trying to fulfill Torah, going through Torah every single year. <laughs> and it's so crazy to think about this. I've I got to get rid of my sin. I've got to get rid of my sin. And they can't. And so either we receive Yeshua as our Messiah, our Savior and Lord, or we're waiting for a Messiah. Okay, And so praise God that we receive Yeshua as our Messiah. But they're still looking to this temple to be rebuilt where the sacrifice could be reinstated and the priesthood as well. Why? Not just for the nation of Israel, but for them individually because they can't get rid of their sin. So they're reminded. These are the Jewish scriptures. These are Hebrew scriptures here in Daniel. So this is what Jesus is referring to about this thing called abomination of desolation. So because it's prophesied that the daily sacrifice will be taken away, there'll be an end to sacrifice and offering, thus and therefore, there's got to be a reinstatement of it. Makes sense, right? So you look at the logic, you're like, wow, God has us in control. We just got to look for what are some of the signs that these things are going to start to be ramped up again. And again, it all points you to a red heifer. Pretty crazy, some of these things, right? Neat stuff, though. So here's what it says in Matthew 24. Again, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, here in the red letters, this is actually Jesus here. And then, again, there in the parenthetical statement, Matthew Levi gives you this little side. Whoever reads, let him understand. And then verse 16, quoting Jesus again, Jesus says, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So Yeshua is telling the Jews to do what? To flee. When? When the abomination of desolation happens. It, folks, we're commanded to love one another. Uh, Jesus came for the Jew and the Gentile. For the Jew first and the Gentile. Us as Gentiles, we're predominantly Gentiles, we're grafted into the vine, right? And so that's Jesus himself, but also Israel. Okay? So you and I need to love the Jewish people. I mean, I, I pray that God would open doors. I don't get open doors like some of you guys. Some of you guys do. Praise God. Right? Like, like Kimmy, she trains like, what, 90% of your clients at your gym? Or like, they're like all Jews. I'm like, oh, I want that. But you see, I think God has equipped me that I can equip others. I'm like, oh, I want to minister to them. But that's just not my calling, I guess. So what I hope for and pray for that 
that we can help each other to understand God's word more. And I personally hope and pray that I can help equip people, help equip Christians for these things so that you could reach out to the Jews far and wide, not just here in New York City, but around the world, because Jesus himself is is giving them, it's like the code. He's speaking here to the Jews. Matthew 24, we're on, we would say biblically, theologically, eschatologically, we're on Jewish ground studying Matthew 24. He's not speaking to the church. He's talking to Jews about Things in Judaism. He even says, pray that this doesn't happen on the Sabbath. Why? Because you don't run on the Sabbath. The Gentiles will be like, I don't care about that. I'm going to run every day. But for the Jews, they won't run. So he says, when this happens, you you guys are going to receive a Messiah. It's going to be a false Messiah. He's going to claim to be God. He's going to go into the temple of God, sit as God, declaring himself as God and to be worshipped as God, that's three and a half years into the seven-year period. We call that the that event the abomination of desolation. And when that happens, Jesus is speaking to the Jews. He says, flee. Flee. So how are they going to know? We're going to the book called Romans right now. Romans chapter 10. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. they got to have faith in Yeshua being Messiah. Their Messiah, not just ours. Their Savior, not just ours. And how are they going to go unless they're sent? How are they going to hear unless someone preaches? I mean, I'm just paraphrasing that. You can read in Romans chapter 10. You and I got to be equipped. You and I need to share with people, Jews and Gentiles, because they need to know this. Because when this happens, they're going to receive Messiah. They're going, yes, we could build our temple. Yes, world peace. Yes, purification for all people. Uh oh, three and a half years. Jesus is saying, you, you better flee. What's going to happen at that point? They're going to be hunted and killed and exterminated. That's extremely sad. Okay? And we're not going to be here. What's that believe? Bible-believing Christians, born-again Christians, in Yeshua, uh, we believe that the rapture of the church is going to happen. We're not going to be here, but we need to equip and share this with others. All right, so as we close here, I'm going to leave it on this slide. We are going to uh, to end this time Thank you, guys. This is uh, I got a lot of slides here. We're going to end our teaching time, and then we're going to have a time where for our small groups, uh, for the men with the men and women with the women, we can discuss these things in our groups. But I want to ponder for all of us, including you guys that are listening online or later on maybe listening to the recording. The temple might be close to being built. Many Jews are expecting a Messiah soon, to present the red heifer. It seems like much of Christianity is asleep. We don't know about these scriptures. We must study them. I'm not saying to support the rebuilding of the temple, but no, we need to be in the know that many of them are looking for a Messiah. They expect a Messiah to be the one to present and somehow be involved in the offering up of this red heifer, I'm telling you, if one of these five is going to be the one to kick off these end time events that we see in the Bible, we're talking that it may be as close as a year, maybe two years. Think about that. Fit that into the timeline of your own life. I'm 53. That means maybe by the time I'm 54 or 55. This is like pretty exciting and pretty quickly. So, question for you, and we could ponder in our small group time. But question for you, how does God want us to live in these days? What is God speaking to you about how he wants you to live? And then we can discuss how we can pray for each other. I'm going to close this with prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this time. We thank you that you love us so much that you sent your only begotten son, Yeshua, our Messiah, our Savior, our Lord. We accept you, Jesus, as our Messiah. You are our great high priest. We're not looking for another priest. We're not looking for another Messiah. Lord, as we see this excitement around the world for the Jews and even Christians, Lord, we know that it points to the future fulfillment of your word and its prophecies, God. And we see that time is short. Help us to be serious about you. Clean things up in our hearts and lives and our walks and our marriages, our families. Help us to commit even more deeply to you and to your word. We praise you and thank you for, as you say in Isaiah 40, verse 8, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. 
Help us to trust in you with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding and in all our ways that we could acknowledge you, that you would direct our paths, God. Guide us. Open doors for us to be able to share these things with family, with friends, with other Christians, with Jews, with Gentiles. Help us, God, to apply your word and to share these things. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen.